This is the uh, 4-2 podcast for uh, Chapter 4, Part 2, What Shapes an Ecosystem. This is going to be a long one, so let's get going. Um, start a little differently here. I put the four topics that we're going to look at. So you can write these down in your notebook. The biotic and abiotic factors, the niche or niche, community interactions, and ecological succession. <clears throat> Starting with biotic and abiotic factors, ecosystems are influenced by a combination of biological and physiological factors, and the biological influences that an ecosystem face are called biotic factors. These are biological influences on organisms, and these can include all the living things which that organism will interact with. Um, for instance, another organism, another animal, maybe plant life, and other non-living things are called, uh, non-living factors are called abiotic factors, and they can include things like the temperature, precipitation, humidity, wind, and nu availability of nutrients, and soil type, sunlight. Lots of different things. This little chart right here shows a few things, a few of these things. Here's precipitation, sunlight, uh, disturbances such as fire, there's soil, nutrients, minerals. Um, so there's a lot of different abiotic factors that can come into it. How do abiotic and abiotic factors influence an ecosystem? They can determine the survival and growth of an organism and the productivity of the ecosystem which the organism is in. Let's do some definitions. This is a habitat. It is the area where an, organisms li where an organism lives. And you can see this uh, appears to be a wolf. It looks kind of fake for a wolf, but that's its habitat. It looks like woods. It's near some water. There's some uh, fallen trees, uh, the particular type of trees, the kind of cover there is, the, the uh, temperature there is, the sunlight there is, the other little animals that are there, those are all part of its habitat. Now, the niche, this is the second big part. The niche is the full range of physical and biological conditions in which an organism lives and the way in which the organism uses those conditions. Here I drew a picture of, uh, not I drew a picture, I included a picture of three birds and these three birds, they um, <clears throat> all live in the same area. They all live on this one on the spruce tree. Um, the niche that's different for them, or the niche that's different for them, is one lives at the top of the tree, the other one lives in the middle of the tree, the third one lives at the bottom of the tree. Um, they all have very similar niches, but they're not exactly the same. They're actually a little different because the physical condition they live is a little different. Now here's a great example. These are uh, uh, Thalamus and Balanus um, uh, barnacles, and the where they live is uh, very interesting compared to where the tide is. So the range of temperatures that an organism needs to survive and its place in the food web are part of the niche, and it often this the uh, these factors will determine the number of different niches in an ecosystem. And I just included this one here because if you look, there's kind of a line right here where the two um, barnacles uh, meet and they actually, one of them is able to survive thalamus with less water and balanus actually has to survive with more water. So tide, the tide will come up to the high tide line here. So you can see that the balanus ones get more water the uh, thalamus ones get less water, but they're able to survive here. The balanus can't survive any higher. So they're each in their own little niche. Here's a picture of um, a uh, sort of a, a uh, what is this, a mangrove uh, uh, forest, and you can see that there are um, the particular thing I want to point out was there were two types of birds. You have a heron here and the kingfisher. 
and they live in the same habitat, but they have different um, niches. One feeds during the day, and it feeds for small fish in and crustaceans in the ocean water. That's the open water. That's the kingfisher. Whereas the heron feeds on shallows in the shallows of the water, and it um, and it feeds mostly during night. Now these two can both be here at the same time because um, they fit different niches. They hunt in different areas, so they're not occupying the same niche. No two species can share the same niche in the same habitat. Different species can occupy different niches that are uh, that are very similar. And as you saw on the other page, the kingfisher and the heron, their niches are very similar. They're in the same area, the same habitat, but they actually and they both hunt for fish, but they hunt in different ways. What interactions occur within communities? This is the next big. Uh, section community interactions when organisms live together they're always interacting with each other so there are um, three big uh, ones we're going to look at uh, competition predation and symbiosis and symbiosis we're going to break down into three different um, three different uh, types of symbiosis so uh, so competition. Competition is when uh, organisms, and they can be of the same or different species, attempt to use an ecological resource in the same place at the same time. These two guys right here are in competition over this carcass. And you can see they're probably fighting over that resource. The carcass is a resource. It's food. And they both want it at the same time. So resource is any necessity of life. And it could be water, nutrients, light, food, space. In this case, we're looking at food. Um, with our barnacles before, we were looking at space. They were both trying to occupy the same space on that rock. And water, actually. They were both trying to get water, but that really falls under space. So, direct competition in nature often results in a winner and a loser, with the losing organism failing to survive. And this is called the competitive exclusion principles. No two species can occupy the same niche in the same habitat at the same time. And this is a rather famous study of two different types of paramecium, paramecium aurelia and paramecium caudatum. And when they were grown separately, you can see they both had pretty good survival rates. But when they were grown in the same culture, meaning they were both grown together, there's that word culture, by the way. You can see that the caudatum eventually died off. Its numbers went down until it was pushed out by the Aurelia. And this is actually a pretty famous experiment by, I believe, a Russian biologist. So let's look at the warblers again. These warblers are in, because they have different niches, they're in different areas. There is, there is, they, well, they avoid direct competition because each one is in a different part of the tree. Predation. So this is when one organism captures and feeds on another, and this is called predation. And here we have a ladybug eating an aphid. We have, uh, that's got to be a cheetah chasing down, it looks like probably an impala. And here's a Venus flytrap. Fly eating that looks like a spider in there so the organism that does the killing and eating is called the predator the food organism is the prey <coughs> let's look at the last of the community interactions we're looking at this is called symbiosis and this is when two species live closely together we call that relationship symbiosis and here we have Nemo well, it's a clownfish, and he's living in a sea anemone. And this is an example of mutualism, which we'll talk about in a minute, where the sea anemone gets a benefit. I'm sorry, the clownfish gets a benefit, but the sea anemone doesn't get harmed nor helped by the relationship. So these relationships can include mutualism, commensalism, and parasitism. Wait, did I say mutualism? I meant commensalism. This is a form of commensalism. 
not mutualism, to see the clown fish and the sea anemone. So here are some examples here. Here we have a little bird. This is definitely an impala. This little bird right here is eating ticks off the uh, impala. So in this case, both species benefit from the relationship. This is an interesting one. This is an ant, and these are aphids, and you saw the, an aphid getting eaten by a ladybug a few slides ago. These aphids, what they will do is they will, uh, um, when, when they're stroked by the ant, they'll produce a little liquid. You can see the liquid right where my mouse is, and the ant feeds on that liquid. I was thinking about this today. This ant then is a, is a um, uh, heterotroph, yet it's not actually eating the aphid. It's eating what the aphid produces. It's dependent on another organism which is an example of a heterotroph. Now here's another one where both people benefit. You probably never thought about this. This is a hummingbird moth, but it could be a hummingbird, it could be a bee, it could be any kind of other organism that comes to a plant, a flower, and uh, takes out nectar from the flower. What it also is doing is little pollen particles get stuck on the organism, on the, on the bird or on the bee, and then that bee or bird flies to another pl another flower and deposits the pollen. So the plant gets the benefit of spreading its pollen around, whereas the bee, the moth, the butterfly, the hummingbird gets the pollen. Now this is commensalism, and this is where one member one member benefits. Sorry, one member benefits, and the other is neither helped nor harmed. This is a, a titan triggerfish, if I remember correctly. And what he does is he goes around the bottom of the ocean and he lifts up rocks looking for things to eat. And these guys right here, they kind of follow him around. And what he, whatever the triggerfish doesn't eat, they eat that's been exposed underneath the rock. So they get the benefit of being with the triggerfish without actually, but the triggerfish doesn't lose anything to them. Over here is an orchid. You can see the orchid here. Here's the flower. And what the orchid is doing is it's growing in this plant in this, on this tree. Now it doesn't take anything from the tree. It just takes runoff from the tree. It kind of just hangs a ride on top of the plant. It actually grows on top of the tree. So the tree isn't getting harmed. It isn't losing anything to the orchid. And the orchid reaps the benefit of having a place to live. Now these are parasitism. And this is when one lives on or inside another organism and harms it. This one you all know, that's a tick. I've had about three or four of those. These black things right here are lampreys. And they're stuck on the side of this poor fish. And they're probably sucking the life out of the fish. And then this here, this one's really interesting. I forget what the bird's name is called. But what happens is this poor tiny little bird right here builds a nest, lays some eggs, and then this other bird comes along and lays this egg. And i got to look up that bird's name. Anyways, when the bird hatches, this poor little bird here takes care of the other baby bird. This is called, uh, this is a, uh, I, th I think it's called brood parasitism. And what hap what the, the reason why it's parasitism is that the, um, the adult bird that lays the foreign egg gets the benefit of not having to raise their own young and the other bird does it for them and that other little bird has to work harder to not only take care of their four you know five chicks they also have to take care of that other bird so it's a form of parasitism what is ecological succession um, what ecological succession is is um, when new uh, as, a, as the ecosystem changes, you're going to have different inhabitants come in and cause changes to that community. And this is, can be in a response to both natural and human disturbances. And it also and it doesn't necessarily have to be from a disturbance. So, ecological session is the series of predictable changes that occurs in a community over time. Sometimes it's a response to an abrupt disturbance. So, and sometimes it's just uh, 
changes to uh, change occurs as a more gradual response to other changes in the environment. Um, there's two main types of it. If you don't have any soil and you have succession that occurs, we call it primary succession. Um, sometimes rock surfaces, you'll have life start to form on a rock surface um, and a often happens with volcanoes and the first ones the first species to populate that area are called pioneer species let's look at this example here we go we have a volcanic eruption and it's destroyed the previous ecosystem it's covered with the dust and the volcanic rock and it looks very lifeless then all of a sudden you have lichens I would say those are the pioneer species the lichens develop and from there uh, mosses will appear and then you'll have grasses take root and uh, the as over time soil starts to develop from the breakdown of the rock and eventually the grasses are replaced by tr small trees and shrubs now secondary concession is um, you can have uh, have secondary concession follow a natural event like a fire so let's say we have a forest fire and um, then you start having the pioneer species come in, replace those plants. Over time, taller trees come in, grasses, shrubs, pines, and then eventually larger, what they call the climax community, larger organisms such as oaks and hickories take in. Um, and a lot of times it's actually restored to its original condition, and this is through secondary succession so you can see here we might have started with an oak forest and in the end as time went on the oaks forest returned but it took but they had to go through a series of different species to get to the point where it was an oak forest now usually things can recover from natural disturbances but it may not recover from long-term human caused disturbances and I threw this picture in because it was two things I saw in here. This is a logging road, and you can see it's been very, it's been rutted away from all the trucks. And also, there are trees downed in here. And these kind of, when you strip apart a uh, forest and take away the trees, a lot of times the soil erodes, and then there's no longer, you have the ability to grow the same trees that were there before. And in that case, it may not recover from the disturbances. Now, one last succession to talk about and this is in a marine ecosystem and we're talking about a permanently deep dark ocean situation and they in uh, this is an, an example which is in your the picture in your textbooks a lot easier to see but what happened was is there was a dead whale they found this dead whale and um, when the whale fell to the bottom of the ocean it started to be eaten by all the um, by the uh, scavengers and the decomposers and after a while the um, what was left of the body the whale's body made the area around it um, rich with nut nutrients which then allowed all kinds of things to grow the um, and then bacteria were able to decompose the oil in the whale bones that was all that was left of the whale and that oil was then used as an energy source for chemosynthetic autotrophs the, the components of the oil and now you can see now we have a chemosynthetic bacteria that then support a large community of organisms so it started off as a dead whale ended up becoming a chemosynthetic um, uh, like a thermal vent community similar to a chemosynthetic community um, from where there was no life at all all it took was that whale to get it started and here's the section quiz